With the release of the Indigo Disc, all starter Pokemon are now catchable in the wild. What if you could do a Pokemon Violet Hardcore Nuzlocke with only starter Pokemon? Well, let's find out. Real quick, before we start this Nuzlocke, I'm going to flash the rules we'll be using here on the screen. And with that out of the way, let's get into the run. The actual run begins with me choosing my Generation 9 starter. The first two failed attempts I went with Meowskerado because the guaranteed critical hit is so nice. But in this run, I decided to go with Fuecoco because I thought about the lack of type coverage that the fire starters had. I'm looking at you, Generations 3, 4, and 5. So we took our little fire croc and we went to Los Platos, which is where I transferred my other starters into the game. Now, I won't spend too much time on the first two gems and the first Titan Cloth because they were pretty easy. When you have nine fire types, it's easy to take out the bug in the grass gem. And with eight water types and eight grass types, let's just say Cloth never really stood a chance. But that brings us to our first challenge of the run, the Sky Titan. Now, if you think about it, competitively, having a bunch of fire, water, grass types is valuable. But when it comes to fighting a flying titan, you have no coverage or really any super effective damage. My strategy was to basically stall with protects and let Arvin hard carry. Marshchomp has rock throw and Breon has icy wind and disarming voice for super effective damage. But what makes this battle so trivial is that unlike all of the other titans in the game, you can heal in between stage 1 and stage 2. With the sky titan bombardier, you can't. So we get into the battle, and I get hit with massive damage from a wing attack, but I also retaliate with decent damage from a rock throw. Debating on if I can stay in or not, I risk it and go for another rock throw. But to my surprise, turn 2, Bombardier goes for a rock throw instead of a wing attack. I'm not sure why, but it gave me a chance to get more big damage. Now, I do want to preface that Marshchomp is the only ground type I can have going into the electric gym. So if I lose him, it can make my run infinitely harder, because Grottle doesn't get the ground typing until Torterra, which is too high of a level for the electric gym. I end up switching into Croconaw, who sends the Titan into Phase 2 with a Water Pulse. With Phase 2 beginning, I protect and I let Arvin set up his useless Rock Polish. The Titan ended up attacking Arvin instead of me, which means I could have gotten an attack off, but it was too risky. So not wanting to test fate with a double protect, I switched to Brion, who takes a Torment, which also meant that I could have attacked, unfortunately. Arvin uses Rock Polish again, for some reason. Now, Arvin already outspeeds the Titan after two Rock Polishes. But, I guess he just wanted to make sure he outsped, so he used Rock Polish again. Bombardier torments the little rock, thank god, meaning that he can't use Rock Polish again. I have Icy Wind on Brion, and I use it, and lo and behold, I miss my 95% accurate move. Since I'm tormented, I can't use Icy Wind again, so I either need to go for damage, or switch out. Arvin attacks. I take a wing attack, and then I retaliate with a disarming voice, almost bringing it to half. The next turn, Arvin attacks again, and I finally get something to go my way as he gets a critical hit. I take a pluck, which brings me down to 9 HP, and I hit the Titan with an icy wind, finishing it off. Not a great way to face our first real challenge, but we get out without losing a single Pokemon. With the Sky Titan out of the way, we have our next challenge, Team Star. All of the Team Star leaders are hard to battle due to their star mobiles. These Pokemon have crazy stats with signature moves that can cause certain status conditions and have stupid abilities that make them hard to deal with, especially when you don't have much type coverage. I wanted to take the first Team Star battle series, even with the fighting coverage we get from the three fire starters, because Giacomo has ruined one of my previous runs before. So we go into battle and our strategy is very simple. We just out damage him. I discovered that Pig Knight is the best answer for the Star Mobile with its early game bulk and good damage output with Arm Thrust, but I have one major issue. I accidentally overleveled it. So with no Pig Knight, I'm relying heavily on our other two juniors, Combuskin and Monferno, who are actually two of the few starters that gain a second typing upon evolution, giving Fighting Stab early on. But that typing has pros and cons because the Pawnier that I have to fight before the Star Mobile is carrying Aerial Ace that does super effective damage to us. So getting rid of the Pawnyard is easy, but to minimize damage, I use Terrifier. So I flame on and double kick that little fella into oblivion, bringing out the Starmobile, who intimidates me. But thanks to the clear amulet that I had put on Combuskin before the battle, my attack isn't lowered. I wanted to get more damage off before I switch out into anything else, and so I go for another double kick. And the Starmobile goes for a metal sound. I guess the game didn't register that the Intimidate didn't lower my stats. So I get a free turn, thanks to the clear amulet again. It attacks with Wicked Torque the following turn, and I keep spamming Double Kick. I'm not sure why, but the following turn, I go for a Detect, thinking I'm doing something, and the Star Mobile goes for a Wicked Torque that hits into my Detect. We trade the same attacks as before, and I get it under half HP, but my Combuskin is at 5 HP, so I switch into Croconaw, who takes an attack, 
the little croc takes one more wicked torque and goes for an ice fang. Our goal right now is just to ensure that the starmobile gets into mock punch range from Monferno, so I switch into bay leaf and take another attack. It uses metal sound the following turn and I use trail base. Protecting to scout out what move it wants to use next, it goes for a snarl. Realizing this, I switch to Monferno, who cleans it up using Mock Punch and not taking much damage. Now, I promise that every fight in this game for me isn't a terrible matchup, but the next one is also not great for us. We have to battle Iono, the third gym leader who uses electric types. As many of you know, and how I mentioned earlier, we only have one ground type in Marsh Tom. Luckily, grass types do resist electric moves, so that's a little bit of a benefit for us. So we're going into this battle, leading Pig Knight into Watch Roll. Now this may sound dumb considering the type matchups, but I know from a previous run that Terra Fire Flame Charge from Pig Knight annihilates the Watch Roll, giving me an early lead and a speed boost. With Watch Roll down, Belly Bolt comes in. In hindsight, I did not respect the Belly Bolt and its ability much because this is where our first mistake happens. I thought that since the Belly Bolt had Water Gun and I was a Fire type, I wouldn't have to worry about Electromorphosis. Let's just say I was wrong. I go for one bulldoze and it hits me with a water gun. Thinking I can take another water gun, I bulldoze again only to power up the spark that hits me next turn and eliminating my pig knight. Devastated, I next go into Crocolore, who incinerates leaving Belly Bolt with 1 HP. I take a water gun in return which is unnecessary damage but we manage to get rid of the Belly Bolt next turn bringing in Luxio. I protect just to scout to see what move it uses and it uses spark. Knowing this, I switch into Marsh Tomp for the immunity. We take a bite with no flinch, thankfully, and bulldoze in return. This brings out Miss Magius. As it Terra Electrics, it goes for a Confused Ray and I Rock Slide. I must have decided I was really going to test Fate this battle or something, as I now have to hit Rock Slides through Confusion. I take a Hex and manage to hit another Rock Slide. I don't want to risk Marsh Tomp's death, so I go into Quilleton, who doesn't take a Hex very well. Realizing I'm now in a bad spot because the Hex did more damage than I thought, I have to make a decision. But instead of making a decision and taking my time to make that decision, I rush my choice thinking I had Protect. Because I've been using Protect on all of my Mons this run, and I accidentally lock a Leech Seed. This gets my Quillet and KO'd, giving me my second mistake this battle. We then go into Bayleaf, who takes a Confuse Ray, but hits a Trailblaze, leaving Miss Magius with just a little bit of HP. We then take a Hex, and hit ourselves in confusion. Weighing the options, I figured it'd be best to get a free switch in and sack the bay leaf. But to my surprise, it takes a hex and lives on 2 HP. To make things even more lucky for me, we snap out of confusion and hit another trailblaze to end the battle. Let's just say between hitting rock slides through confusion and barely surviving and snapping out of confusion at the end of the battle was really, really lucky. We ended up losing two Pokemon this battle with Pig Knight and Quilladin, but it could have been way worse. Now that we got through Iono, our next matchups are very easy, so I'm going to blow through them. We basically solo mellow with Marsh Tomp, and we destroy Orthworm with Crocolore. And we head to the fourth gym, the Water Gym. The only issue with Kofu that I was worried about was that his Veluza gets Pluck. In hindsight, I may have respected that too much, but we defeat him with Feraligator, which I actually didn't know evolved so early, and our many grass types. After Kofu, this brings me to our next big challenge, Atticus. Atticus might actually have been the hardest boss in the entire game for me, just due to how poison types are and the fact that I barely have any super effective damage into them. Now, remember how I said I was going to use Terrastalization at the very beginning of this video? Well, I didn't exactly specify how I was going to use Terrastalization. To not make this run incredibly easy, I told myself I was only going to use the default Terra type that came when I hatched my Pokemon. For most of the starters, this was fire, water, or grass, but there are two starters that can actually be very different, and out of sheer luck, I managed to get something that probably saved this run. My Bulbasaur was Terra Poison. So let me back up real quick. Firstly, I didn't realize Bulbasaur and Rowlet actually have secondary typings, these being poison and grass. I thought they were strictly just one type, like all starters. While my Rowlet didn't have Terra Flying, which would have been sick, my Bulbasaur did have Terra Poison. This makes fighting the Poison Squad infinitely easier as Poison resists itself and also can't be poisoned by itself. What's even better is I now can have a Torterra and a Venusaur that can learn Earthquake. So enough of me yapping, let's get into the actual Team Star battle and my strategy. I actually thought up this brilliant strategy that involved Misty Terrain that can prevent Poison and using berries to cure the Poison, but the battle didn't go close to what I planned. We lead Torterra into Skuntank, who sucker punches and then goes bye-bye 
with a Torterra Earthquake. Atticus switches into Muck, who also takes an Earthquake. Reverum comes out and hits me with an Iron Head, which thankfully doesn't flinch, but it does crit. I retaliated with an Earthquake, which also crits him, but it didn't matter since Reverum was also 4 times a week to the move. I decide to switch into Brion, who takes a Noxious Torque. It then hits me with another Noxious Torque, and I use Misty Terrain. Now, in hindsight, I probably didn't need to use Misty Terrain, but I did anyways. After the Misty Terrain, I switch to Venusaur, who takes an attack rather well, and heals with its leftovers. We Terra Poison an Earthquake, and with how little damage we took, the Terra probably wasn't necessary, but we did it anyways. The first Earthquake did activate Toxic Debris, but it was pretty much pointless. I did make a mistake and accidentally click Leech Seed, which if you don't know, Leech Seed doesn't affect the Star Mobile. So I did take a pointless attack, but then we just start spamming Earthquake and it attacks us for little damage, and we recover with leftovers. But after a few attacks, Venusaur finally gets low on HP, so we decide to switch to Feraligator, who learns Stomping Tantrum. Misty Terrain had also expired by the time I switched into Feraligator, so I did get poisoned, but the poison was cured thanks to my Pecha Berry. Feraligator cleans up the battle, and we finally move on to our next victim. Now, the reason I respected Atticus so much was because I had previously only lost two runs. As you know, the first one was to Giacomo, and the second one was actually to Atticus. So I made sure I used every strategy to ensure my victory against him because I didn't want to risk losing another run to him. Next on our list is Larry. I wasn't too worried about Larry, especially since now we have our fully evolved starters. This is probably also a good time to mention that to keep the run challenging, I was not using the starter Pokemon's hidden abilities. They all will have Blaze, Torrent, or Overgrow. Now with Larry next, we actually have a stretch of three gym leaders we are about to fight here, and most of them are a breeze, especially with our fully evolved starters now. We have two of our three fire fighting types and a fire ghost type, Skeleturge, for Larry, so we easily sweep through him. For Rhyme, we have two dark types with Incineroar and Greninja, and our ghost type with Skeleturge. We do Terra Fire the Skeleturge to minimize the damage, but we easily sweep. I guess I should also say that Nimona has challenged us like twice and we swept her. Not sure if I said that earlier or not. But after sweeping Rhyme, we head towards the Psychic Gym. And this is where I make the saddest mistake yet. I'll see. Oh, you don't even need to get Bull Demon really, but if you just want to get it for the gold in the regen, you could. I wouldn't fight him again until you have your Aussie. He's gonna have his Argus back up. So just do this, do mids, do your blue back, get your Aussie, and then. Dude, I can't compete. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's fine. Can't. If he steals it, it's not a big deal. It's nothing he gets off. So while trying to level up, I lose arguably one of the best starters competitively to a Mudsdale. With Rillaboom now gone, we head to the Psychic Gym, which also. I wasn't really too worried about. We basically had the same lineup from the last gym with our ghost type and two dark types. I didn't want to spend too much time talking about Tulip, but something major happens in this battle that I want to show. So for starters, Tulip leads with Ferrid Giraffe and I lead Incineroar. This is a matchup I'm all too familiar with in VGC. We one shot with Darkest Lariat and Gardevoir comes out. We take a Dazzling Gleam and use Darkest Lariat again, but it almost KOs. The following turn is a repeat and we take out Gardevoir. Espathra comes out, and Espathra really doesn't have a single move that can touch Incineroar, so it also gets one shot. So far, the battle is going good. Since Incineroar is low, I need to switch him out. I switch Skeledurge into a Moonblast, which does a little damage. Now pay close attention here. I think Terra gets me anywhere. I'm just gonna Shadow Ball. That does nothing. I do get a special defense drop now. Oh my god. Wait, how's- Whoa, It's a speed tie?! What?! I was just faster last turn, bro! I thought I was gonna be faster! Oh no, I didn't know it was a speed tie! So let me try to explain. After switching in and taking the Moonblast, that following turn I outsped with a Shadow Ball. I took massive damage from a Terra Psychic Psychic from the Florges and it left me with 1 HP. Based on the following turn, I should have been faster, so I stayed in and used Shadow Ball. 
My only explanation is that somehow we had a speed tie. In the first turn, I won the speed tie. In the second turn, I lost it. If you guys don't know how speed ties work in Pokemon, it's literally just a 50-50 coin toss. Sometimes you win the speed tie, sometimes you lose it. What really just baffled me is because I've been using Skeledurge this whole run, and I've been getting EVs unintentionally, meaning that throughout this run, I had KO'd just enough Pokemon to let me speed tie with Tulip's Forges. After losing two Pokemon in Alphernada, I wanted to get away from them. Luckily, we have a trip to the desert and Iron Treads next. This Titan wasn't very challenging. The battle begins with Iron Treads hitting me with a rapid spin and myself setting up Reflect. The following turn, I take an Iron Head with no flinch, thankfully, and fire off a Petal Blizzard. The next turn, Iron Treads uses Rapid Spin again for some reason, while I hit it with big damage with a Petal Blizzard. With Meganium now weak, I switch to Swampert who takes another Rapid Spin. The following turn, the Titan hits me with a knockoff, and I fire off a Waterfall, sending it into Phase 2. With Phase 2 beginning, we do the same setup. We take a Rapid Spin and set up a Reflect. But this time, we have Arvin Scovillain, who uses Scary Face, to now lower its speed. With the speed drop, we now outspeed, and I hit it with a Stomping Tantrum, and then Arvin Scovillain actually attacks and uses Fire Fang. The Titan retaliates and attacks Scovillain with an Iron Head. The following turn, I use Petal Blizzard, and Arvin uses Fire Fang again and actually manages to get a burn. With a weakened attack now, it hits Meganium with a Stomping Tantrum, doing basically nothing. We finally clean up the battle, firing off our attacks once more and soaring us into our next challenge. I use the term challenge lightly, as even without our busted Gen 9 starter, Skeledurge, the Ice Gem was just easy. I'm not going to say much here, because with our many fire types, and we still have Empoleon, Grusha was just a pushover. However, we are starting to get close to our endgame in the major story climaxes with two big challenges in the way, those being the Fairy and the Fighting Team star bases. We begin with Ortega. I lead Venusaur into his Azumarill. I Terra Poison Sludge Bomb to ensure I KO this thing in one shot. With Azumarill gone, he switches into Wigglytuff, who faces the same fate. Dash Bun is his next Pokemon, and this thing actually surprisingly outspeeds me and hits me with a Crunch, and also gets a defense drop. Inevitably, we retaliate with a Sludge Bomb that sends it to Oblivion as well. With the Starmobile coming out and a defense drop, I was a little worried, so I decided to switch into Empoleon, who takes a Steel Roller very nicely. The next turn, the Starmobile hits me with a Confuse Ray as I go for Flash Cannon, but I hit myself in Confusion. I then take a Magical Torque while still trying to fire off a Flash Cannon, and I succeed. The next turn plays out exactly the same, and I now have Ortega on the ropes. But with Empoleon weak, I have to make a switch. I go into Blastoise, who takes a Magical Torque well, Seeing the same patterns, the Starmobile goes for a Confuse Ray as I click Flash Cannon, and I hit through the Confusion this time, and this finishes off Ortega. But don't worry, we still have more Team Star action, as we now have Airy to face. Airy's fighting types are something fierce, but we have the power of friendship, or something like that. She begins the battle with her Toxicroak, and I lead a Delphox. Worried about Sucker Punch, I use Will-O-Wisp to start the battle, and burn the Toxicroak. To neutralize any more damage I can take, I Terra Fire while taking the Sucker Punch, but I retaliate with a quad effective Psychic. Her next Pokemon is Pissimian, and I just nuke it with another Psychic as well. Now I know her Annihilate is tanky, but I do outspeed it, and I hit it with a Psychic that leaves it with about 25% of its HP, but it fires off a close combat. The following turn I finish it off with another Psychic, bringing out her Lucario. However, her Lucario falls, but this time to a Terrifier Flamethrower instead of a Psychic. With only the Starmobile left, I decide to make a Sacrifice. I actually wasn't expecting to outspeed here, but I do get a Psychic off, and then I say my farewell to Delphox, who annihilated her old team. With Delphox gone, I go into Charlizard, who cleans up the battle with an Air Slash. With that being the last Team Star base, that leaves us with only a few battles left. The next battle will be the False Dragon Titan, but let's be real here, with this lineup we have, there really is no issue taking down Don Dozo and his little shrimp. After this Titan, we go into the Elite Four. I think a lot of people actually fight Director Clavel before the Elite Four. But with the level caps on all these end game battles and being so close, I wanted to go into the Elite Four with a commanding team. And I also didn't want to risk over leveling or losing a crucial Pokemon for the champion battle. Our Elite Four team consisted of Primarina, the VGC Goat, Sceptile, Swampert, Char Lizard, and Infernape. Rika and his ground types are the first of the Elite Four. I lead with Primarina, who destroys his Whiskash with Energy Ball. Rika's next Pokemon is Donphan, who doesn't take a Terra Water Sparkling Aria very well. Luckily for Donphan, it has Sturdy. It retaliates with a Poison Jab that does more than I'd like, 
but then it just falls the next turn. Doug Trio comes in next, who uses Sandstorm, and then also catches the Primarina Smoke. The following Pokemon is Camera Up, and let's just say, it didn't end well for this little fella. Clodsire is Rika's last Pokemon and the Ace. I switch into Sceptile, and the Clodsire goes for Terra Ground Protect? Not sure what Rika was cooking there, but I outspeed it on the following turn and fire off a big energy ball. Sceptile then takes a Terra Ground Earthquake well, and then cleans up on the following turn, bringing down our first Elite Four member. The next Elite Four member is a literal child for some reason that uses one of, if not the best types in the game. Poppy opens up her battle with a Copperaja, and I lead the most overrated starter. We nuke the Steel Elephant with a Flamethrower, bringing out Magnezone. Predicting an electric move, I switch to Swampert, but instead it sets up a Light Screen. The Light Screen isn't ideal, but we take the next turn and fire off an Earthquake, activating Magnezone Sturdy. We take a Tri Attack, and then Swampert cleans up the Magnezone the next turn, bringing out Poppy's Corviknight. I then switch to Char Lizard while the Corviknight sets up an Iron Defense. I click the extra damage button and fire off a Terrifier Flamethrower that almost KOs the Corviknight in one hit. But the Corviknight just turns around and uses Iron Defense again. So then the following turn, we finish it off with another Flamethrower and bring out Bronzong. Continuing the same pattern, we click Flamethrower again, and to my surprise, we actually get the one shot on our Bronzong. This brings out her Ace and Tinkaton, but naturally, we just click the same move and send Tinkaton to the grave, taking us to our next Elite Four member. The battle with Larry started out great, as it basically was a pre Marina Ice Beam sweep. We took some damage from a Star Raptor Brave Bird, but that was all. With 89 HP left, Larry sends out Oracorio. I assumed it was going to hit me with an electric attack, so I pivot into Swampert only to be found with a Confused Ray. With Swampert Confused staring down an electric type, I'm having flashbacks to Lavincia. The following turn, I take an Air Slash and attempt to hit a Rock Slide. And you probably think, I just hit myself in Confusion, right? Nah, I just have a classic Rock Slide miss. The next turn plays out exactly the same as I test Fate time and time again, but this time I do hit the Rock Slide. The only issue is, it doesn't KO the Oracorio. Frustrated, I switch to Charizard, who takes an Air Slash. Charizard then outspeeding the next turn, KOs this little yellow monster, bringing out Larry's Flamigo. Then, I proceed to make the most bonehead play ever. I'm not sure what my thought process was, because I switched to Sceptile, who takes a Terra Flying Brave Bird. Needless to say, I now have a free switch in. I bring out Infernape, and I Terra Fire Flame Wheel. I take big damage from another Brave Bird, but since I outspeed, I KO on the next turn. With one less Pokemon, I now have to face the Dragon Guy, because there's a lot of those in Pokemon for some reason. He leads with Norvern, and I lead Swampert. The Norvern is kind of annoying because it has Super Fang, which takes half of your HP no matter what. The battle starts as I take a Super Fang, and then I retaliate with a Rock Slide. The next turn, Norvern hits a Dragon Pulse, leaving me in the yellow, and I finish it off with another Rock Slide. Seeing the grass weakness of Swampert, Hassel brings out Flapple. I switch to Char Lizard, who then takes a Seed Bomb from the Little Fruit. A gust of wind sends this thing to the Pokemon Center and brings out Hassel's Haxorus. I switch to Primarina, who takes a Rock Tomb and a Speed Drop. But, predicting an Iron Head, I tear a Water Moon Blast and just one-shot the Haxorus. Before I can get to the monster that is Bax Caliber, I have to get through some Dragon Kelp. I pivot into Ensign, who takes a Thunderbolt rather well. The following turn, I parting shot and switch into Swampert, who dodged a Hydra Pump via my shout. The following turn, we outspeed and KO the Dragaegle with an Earthquake. And this brings out the Pseudo Legendary. With Swampert being weak, I switch to Incineroar again, who takes a Terra Dragon Glaive Rush, leaving me with 5 HP. We switch to Charizard, who takes a Brick Break. I managed to get some chip damage with Dragon's Breath, but then we say goodbye to our OG fire type as this Terra Dragon Glaive Rush sends him back to 1998. Now with a free switch in, we bring in Primarina to clean up the last Elite Four member with a Moon Blast. This takes us to our champion battle with Gita. As a friendly reminder, I'm down to four Pokemon. Gita leads his Spathra, and I lead Incineroar. Incin takes a Dazzling Gleam and then hits his Spathra with a Darkest Lariat. I have a look as our next Pokemon, and man, let me tell you, having Charizard right here would be really nice since Avalug has like negative 50 special defense. However, we parting shot into our only special attacker who takes an Avalanche. The next turn, we almost KO the Avalug with a Moon Blast, as it hits me with an Earthquake. Cleaning up the Avalug the next turn brings out Gita's Go Go. So we make a pivot into Incineroar, who takes a Horn Leech rather well. We then proceed to Flare Blitz the Go-Go, getting a critical hit that I don't really think matters. 
King Gambit now hits the field, but with Supreme Overlord, we don't have to worry about activating Defiant. So we parting shot into Infernape, who gets hit with a Stone Edge, and thankfully it didn't crit. We then heal back that damage with a Drain Punch that KOs her King Gambit. This brings out her Veluza. With not many options, I switch into Primarina, who takes a Liquidation. Thankfully, no defense drop. The following turn, we hit Veluza with an Energy Ball that brings out Gita's Ace, Glamora. Glamora wouldn't be a bad Pokemon here if she didn't tear a rock. However, we do switch into Swampert into a Terra Rock Glamora that hits me with a Sludge Wave. The next turn, we take an Earth Power and we one-shot the Glamora, defeating the champion with just our four Pokemon. So I finally get to bring out some of the new faces that I haven't used yet. The Combuskin we used earlier is now a Blaziken. And we also have a Choice Scarf Eruption Typhlosion, so that's pretty lit. But the first new face to show up is Greninja. I don't think I actually used the Greninja in a battle up to this point, but now it's his time to shine. Clavel leads Oranguru and I lead Greninja. We almost KO the Oranguru with a Night Slash, but then it hits me with Eon. Fearing the Sleep Demons, I switch into Typhlosion who eats a foul play. We then click the Eruption button and finish off the Oranguru. This forces Clavel to bring out his Houndoom. I switch into Feraligator, and Feraligator eats a Dark Pulse on the switch in. The following turn, we then take another Dark Pulse, with no flinch thankfully, and then Feraligator retaliates with a Waterfall. Clavel then goes into his Obama Snow, and this puts me in a weird situation because the Obama Snow can set up a Roar Veil, which I don't want, but I also could just attack and KO my Feraligator. I make the safe play and switch into Typhlosion while the Aurora Veil goes up. I then KO the Obama Snow, bringing out the Poltergeist. I stay in to try and get some chip damage while taking a Shadow Ball. Not wanting to lose my Typhlosion, I go into Greninja while the Poltergeist uses Shell Smash. The following turn, it then will it with me and I hit it with a Night Slash that activates its weak armor. The following turn, I take a Shadow Ball and then I KO the Poltergeist with a Night Slash. This brings out Clavel's Amoongus. I decide at this point, Greninja is burnt and is very weak, so I decide to stay in and give up the Greninja. I go into Typhlosion, who to my surprise actually one-shots the Amoongus. With Quaquavel now hitting the field and my Typhlosion weak, I decide to stay in and sacrifice it. This grants me a switch into Venusaur, who then takes an Ice Spinner and hits Quaquavel with a Grass Pledge, defeating Director Clavel. We did lose two Pokemon, but their sacrifices were not in vain. We move up to the Lighthouse to fight Arvin. He leads with his Greedent and I lead Blaziken. Blaziken takes out the Little Squirrel with a close combat. He then proceeds to bring in a Rock-type, who actually manages to survive my next close combat. Garganeckle then hits an Earthquake and brings me down to my Focus Sash, thanks to the defense drops. With my Blaziken on 1 HP, I switch to Torterra, who takes the next Earthquake. The following turn, I outspeed and then use Earthquake to KO the Garganeckle. This brings out Scovillain. I pivot into Incineroar and actually manage to dodge a Fire Blast. The following turn, we do outspeed and hit Scovillain with the Darkest Lariat, but it doesn't KO. The Scovillain manages to land a Fire Blast the next turn, but it doesn't do much damage. And then the following turn repeats itself. This brings out the Toad School. Toad School hits Incineroar with an Earth Power, and then a Parting Shot into Feraligator. The following turn, Feraligator takes a Power Whip, but then proceeds to hit the Toad School with a Quad Effective Ice Fang. This forces Arvin to bring out his Cloyster. With Cloyster out, I switch into Venusaur. We manage to take no damage on the switch in as Cloyster sets up Light Screen, which isn't ideal, but we can get around that. I decide to Terra Poison my Venusaur to remove our Ice Weakness and then use Grass Pledge. With Light Screen up, I was worried that I wouldn't get the KO, but since Cloyster has negative special defense, it actually falls. This leads us to Arvin's Mavistiff. The Doggo comes in and hits my Terra Poison Venusaur with the Psychic Fang as I launch a Blind Sleep Powder and actually manage to connect. With a free turn now, I hit the Mavistiff with a Sludge Bomb that does almost half. Surprisingly, I didn't want to test Fate, so I made a safe play and I switched into Blaziken. This actually ended up getting Blaziken KO'd since it did wake up, but it granted me a free switch in to Empoleon. With Empoleon out, the Mavistiff hits me with a Crunch that actually did way more damage than I thought it would. I retaliate with a Surf, but this puts me in a predicament. I need to make another switch so I don't lose my Empoleon. So I go into Feraligator who actually manages to survive the crunch on the switch in, leaving it with only 11 HP. I was fully prepared to give up my Feraligator, so I stayed in and used Waterfall, and I somehow managed to outspeed the Mavistiff and finish it off with a Waterfall. I was a little worried there with Arvin, but now we only have three battles remaining. But to be honest, these battles with both Penny and Nimona weren't very challenging. 
Apparently Penny's AI doesn't recognize the clear amulet item because she kept trying to hit my Cinderace with baby doll eyes and it was doing absolutely nothing. The evolution team is nice, but I just use the easy type advantages to take out her team. The next finale is with Nimona. And let's just say, Choice Scarf Swampert goes crazy. We did get a lucky crit on her Dunsparce after it got a coil boost, but hey, sometimes I get lucky, okay? I then take out her Orthworm with a couple of Drain Punches with Infernape, and then she brings out her Gujra. I switch Infernape into Primarina, who takes a Muddy Water, but on the following turn, we launch a Moonblast that brings it under half. The Gujra then hits me with a Sludge Bomb that poisons me, but we take out the Gujra with a Moonblast the next turn. This brings out our ace, the critical hitting cat of doom. But we do have an answer to this crazy cat. So we switch in Venusaur, who takes the flower trick, and then the following turn hits the Meowskarado with the sludge bomb, winning me the champion battle. With Penny and Nimona out of the way, this takes us to our very last battle. Our last battle is with the Giga Chad that is Arvin's dad. Professor Turo opens up with an Iron Moth that falls immediately to a Choice Scarf Earthquake. I was expecting Iron Bundle to come in next and hit me with a freeze dry, but for some reason Turo brings in Iron Thorns. This makes it very easy for my Choice Scarf locked Swampert to hit it with another Earthquake. With two of his Pokemon down, he finally switches into Iron Bundle. I switch Incineroar into the freeze dry, who takes it very easily. Bundle then hits Incineroar with a Water Pulse and actually manages to land a Confusion. But Incineroar being the goat that he is, gets a parting shot off through Confusion, getting me Venusaur in for free. Now before the battle, I had equipped Venusaur with a Yachi Berry, preparing to take on a Freeze Dry. However, when Venusaur hits the field, the bundle just used Snowscape. I'm not sure what the thought process was there from Turo, but we'll take it. We land our Grass Pledge, KOing the bundle in one hit, and this brings out Iron Jugulus. I switch Primarina into the Air Slash that does little damage. I protect for Leftovers Recovery while the Jugulus uses Air Slash again. The next turn, I go for a Terra Water Moon Blast and manage to dodge an Air Slash. This takes out the Jugulus and brings out the monster that is Iron Hands. Expecting a fake out, I protect, which I actually call correctly. I then switch into Torterra, who thanks to its ground typing, is immune to the incoming Thunder Punch. I take a gamble here and use Headlong Rush, expecting it to KO the Iron Hands, but it only leaves it with like four HP. The Iron Hands then retaliates with a Drain Punch, gaining some of that HP back. And then the following turn, Torterra cleans up the Iron Hands with an Earthquake. This brings out the ace Iron Valiant. Seeing no reason to take any unnecessary damage, I leave Torterra in, which takes a Brick Break. With Torterra falling, it grants me a free switch into Primarina. The Valiant uses Brick Break again, and I fire off one final attack for the run. With that being done, if you watch this, please let me know if you have any suggestions for a Nuzlocke or any kind of Pokemon video. With the new regulation coming for VGC, expect some new content with the restricted legendaries. And as always, if you enjoyed, please drop a like, subscribe, and I'll catch you guys on the next one.